Um, so hi, everybody, and welcome to Digital Technologies and 21st Century Learners. Um, my name is Rosanna Flutie. I'm Director of Education at Art21.org, and it's my pleasure to be acting as chair on this particular panel uh, because I really do feel and the um, tenor and tone of these two presentations are really looking at the way that education can forge forth on new conversations um, about how we can be acting in this space. And I keep thinking about also for the context of this conference at MCN, I do think that uh, we're being able to have more sessions that are positioning educators at being the forefront of these types of conversations. So uh, my role will be twofold. I'll be uh, keeping track of the time, but also uh, be looking to you all to see if you have questions. Uh, we're going to be using a hashtag in this particular session, so I've just put it up as MCN 2012 CL21, so uh, Century Learner, 21st Century Learner. And um, uh, I think that what we'll do is because we'll be able to have a little bit longer for the presentations, it also means we can have more time for uh, discussion afterwards. So whether you'd like to hold on, um, then we can uh, be able to take your questions, but also feel free to tweet them. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Darren Milligan. He's a senior media designer, webmaster at Smithsonian Institute, uh, the um, Center for Education and Museum Studies. And, uh, and that he'll be speaking about personalized learning, how to discover the tools that will enable teachers, students, and everyone to find, understand, and adapt museum resources, or dot, 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 how to accept responsibility in a digitally enabled world. So with that, I'm gonna pass the VGA, and, uh, and he'll uh, take it from there. Yeah, so I think I have the longest title of any MCN <laughs> proposal, so I think that's pretty great. Um, so I'm going to talk about some specific projects today that um, I've been working on um, with uh, uh, my team at the office. And, you know, I, I've, I've been sort of struggling with how to, um, how to frame these in a way um, with some of the things that I've been thinking about lately. Um, and really actually noticing in our community and, and thinking about, especially here at MCN, um, and, and really thinking about how education and technology overlap and, and where they fit in with our responsibilities towards those that we serve. So this might be sort of rambling a bit, and if I you know, start to ramble too much, somebody kind of you know, wave your hand or give me the finger or something, so I know to kind of move on. So, you know, I, I think all of us, you know, we're in museums, we love museums, we love collections. Um, we've all had that experience where we, we find something that's personally meaningful with something in our collection, with someone, with an expert in, in, in a museum. And we've had that transformative experience of our, life, our lives being different because of that. Um, and, you know, the reality of, of that is that, you know, many young people will never have that opportunity. Um, you know, I was digging into some stats trying to figure out, you know, how many kids actually come on field trips to museums? And, and um, a, a study looked at that actually in 07, 08, 55 million students were able to take school trips, which, you know, is actually pretty great. That's kind of, kind of works out to about one, one field trip per student per year, which kind of sounds really awesome. Um, I think it was, I was surprised that was a lot more than I had expected. Um, the American Association of School Administrators did a survey in 2011 um, and actually found sort of some troubling news about that. So um, um, looking for, at school administrators, more than a third of them eliminated field trips in the 2010-2011 school year. Um, in the last school year, 2011-2012, 57% anticipated at the time canceling field trips. So, you know, the projects I'm going to talk about today are really an effort to address um, our role as, as museums in that, that kind of new reality. Um, and, so, you know, I, I'm really interested in making sort of the resources at the, Smith at the Smithsonian and sort of resources in museums um, answer kind of a really important question. Um, so, you know, I've got this on my wall in my office and I put it up when I first kind of started thinking about this stuff and started working in this area to kind of remind myself, like, this is what I'm doing, you know, this is what I'm supposed to be accomplishing. Um, so, you know, I, it, it turned it up, it turned, it turned up being something more of kind of uh, a challenge to people who came into my office. Um, as, as sort of a, a marking of what the ground rules are in this space. Um, so, 
you know, I put that up there to sort of share it with you and encourage you to sort of think about that in your own in your own context as well. You know, what 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 can my museum to really uh, be doing to help young people be successful, or what can my resources be doing to help young people be successful? Um, so a little context, I work at this place called the Center for Education and Museum Studies, which um, is a small office in this giant sort of behemoth of the Smithsonian. Um, and our, our role is to connect the resources of really the entire Smithsonian um, with teachers and with learners wherever they are. And so, um, you know, we, we don't deal with the students coming to the museums. We're really sort of um, charged with reaching everyone else. Um, and so naturally we do that a lot through technology. Um, and really the end goal being uh, increasing the impact that the Smithsonian can have um, on, on learners. Um, and so, you know, each of our museums have education offices, they produce educational material, um, you know, they put them up on sites like this, um, which, you know, work really well for people who, you know, know our geography, understand how we're organized uh, in, in the physical spaces, um, but doesn't really work well for, for people who aren't. And so, my office, you know, before, before I came in 2003 actually launched this site. So this is smithsonianeducation.org. Um, it's a, a, a site whose main feature is an index collection of uh, educational resources, learning resources that are aligned to state national common core standards. Um, so there's about 2,000 resources there, and a resource is a, a lesson plan, a website, uh, some sort of interactive. Um, and, you know, so I get a lot of pressure as the webmaster of this site to, um, to redesign this. You know, I mean, it's, geez, it's almost 10 years old. We, you know, this needs to look prettier, it needs to work better. Um, and, you know, um, I'm, I've been sort of trying to get out of that business for a while. Um, you know, I, I, I think there are, are better things to, to, be, to be done. And so, you know, um, so in, in conversations, you know, a, a, a while, we, we really began thinking about what is it that we're producing and what is it that we're publishing and how are we making it available? And do we, are we really doing that in the best way? And, and I think, you know, I think people in my office really sort of found some um, courage and, and admitted to ourselves that we really didn't know, um, know, know much about the audience that we were supposed to be serving. Um, you know, the Smithsonian kind of suffers from its popularity in, in a certain way. You know, people will always come into the museums, the lesson plans are downloaded, and I think from a, from a leadership or administrative perspective, it's very hard to think about change. Um, when you are um, seen or as or seen from a, a traditional standpoint as being successful, um, so um, we really, you know, came to find and began to think about what we had been working on, what my office had been publishing, and the way we had been publishing it, um, you know, sort of like this. You know, like, you know, and, you know, we might be offering a really classy version of this or like to think that we're offering a really classy version of this. But, you know, I mean, it's a frozen dinner. I mean, it's the same thing for everybody, um, you know, chicken or steak. I mean, it, it's it's um, it's not as much as we could be doing. Um, so, um, you know, we then kind of have to ask ourselves, what do our users need? So, you know. We started thinking about food and, and continuing along that lines, and so, you know, people, humans need, you know, they need this. They need high quality raw materials, right? So, those could be lesson plans, websites, or they could be digitized content collections, right? They need some way of beginning to work with them. Um, they need a, a set of simple tools. Um, or, you know, maybe expanding that, they need an entire tool set. So a kitchen, a kitchen that has um, lots of tools, devices, cookbooks, uh, places to store their raw material. Um, so um, this is a, a quote by the Smithsonian secretary when we, when we launched or announced the learning registry at the Smithsonian a couple years ago. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it talks about ambitious plans. And, and, you know, I always like to think that I, you know, hold... Uh, um, joint press releases, uh, press conferences with the secretary, which of course I don't. But, uh, you know, I, I, I like to add on to this quote to, you know, enable these audiences to use our content to improve their lives. So I think, you know, it's one thing to think about reaching these audiences and using technology and, and enabling learning, but it, it's important to understand that it's really about the use of this content. Um, so right around the same time as this secretary coming, um, actually many people in this room helped to um, uh, create the uh, um, Smithsonian Web and New Media Strategy that called for an updated Smithsonian learning model. So um, this is a graphic from, from that. Um, and 
I'm just going to read a little bit for a second here. The strategy is based on the growing understanding of learning as a hybrid of formal education and self-directed discovery that can be brought together and enhanced by online tools and communities. Um, so this is really the framework in which we begin to think about how our office serves these, these learners and really thinks about how, what our responsibility is towards, towards, uh, uh, towards these, these users. Um, so what do we do, right? You know, I, I think museum educators are really uniquely positioned um, to, help, uh, to help make this happen. And um, I think if we're prepared to do three things, uh, we can do that. Um, so the first is to create digital inquiry opportunities for learners. Um, the next is to operate more ubiquitously within the digital space. And the third is to um, you know, allow or empower or you know, make them, our users, um, do the work, expose our collections alongside tools that foster 21st century skills. Um, so, you know, this thinking um, kind of aligns with some work that, that Scott Kratz at the Building Museum and, and Elizabeth Merritt, who, who um, many of you may know, um, uh, have been working on thinking about the future of museums. So I'm going to talk about three projects um, at Smithsonian Education that we've been working on to sort of make this a reality. So uh, the first one, this is the Create Inquiry Opportunities for Learners piece. Um, and so my office historically has m done educational publishing. So we've put out uh, teacher lesson plans um, uh, twice a year that are sort of uh, um, uh, um, you know, printed, really formal experiences. Um, and so we're really shifting that. We're moving away from a teacher focus more towards a learner focus, from a print base to a digital base. And, you know, and the reason for that really is you know, there, are, there are six million teachers uh, in, in the US, which is a huge number. I mean, it's a really important audience, I think. Probably everybody in this room, because you're here, you acknowledge that those are really important uh, people that museums need to be engaging with. You know, but there's 50 million students, like 50 million. That's a lot bigger number, right? So. Um, Technology enables us to, to really reach those people in a, in a way that maybe we haven't been able to in the past. Um, so we're working on transitioning our, our old print publications. We're uh, in the process of creating digital, um, you know, fixed web or tablet-based or mobile demonstrations, simulations, games, so turning these, these learning experiences and making them really relevant um, uh, for, for the learner. Um, and then we're going to sort of take these and, and wrap them in kind of what we're calling a pedagogical wrapper. So um, the experience is not designed to be used in school, but we're providing some lesson integration tips and alignments to standards so that um, integrating them into formal learning um, is, is simpler. Um, so, you know, this is what our, publish, our publications looked like at the beginning. So this is from March of 1976. Art de Zoo was the name of this. Um, uh, let me go through here. So this is 21 years later. I always have to show this one because it was called The Internet and You, which I think is kind of really hilarious. And, you know, this is uh, uh, 97, so there's 30 million people on the Internet at this point. Um, so today there's like two to two and a half billion. Um, you know, and I think, you know, if, if we don't think about those numbers pretty seriously as museums, we're, we're making a big mistake. Those are, those are um, a lot of people accessing a lot of content digitally, and, and I, I think you know, this conference and all, all of us here are really, I think, trying to figure that out. Um, uh, so this is what that publication looks like today, or at least a year or so ago when we were still doing this. Um, this is an issue uh, on the universe. It's a 16-page uh, mailed lesson plan. Um, it goes to every elementary and middle school in the country, so we mail out about 80,000 of these. Um, on smithsonianeducation.org, they're published as a PDF um, alongside some video material, some links to some online conference sessions, uh, but also um, with uh, an interactive. And so this was sort of the first attempt to say, what experience would a teacher create with this? Can we model that in a way that a learner could interact with on their own? Um, and so, you know, just looking at, at this particular one in the past year, so the PDF lesson plan was downloaded about 2,000 times, and the interactive was played 15,000. So, you know, the data is really backing up kind of what we were thinking might be the right direction to go for, for this kind of material. Um, so the interactives are really uh, meant to engage kids directly online with standard line experiences, you know, whether they're guided by their teacher or their parent or, or not. Um, um, okay, so, so two, the second piece. This is the operating more ubiquitously within the digital space piece. Um, and this is about metadata and sometimes content. So um, 
the SmithsonianEducation.org, the 2,000 educational resources, we have generated metadata about these, and we're um, we're we're sharing it. You know, we're we're aggressively pursuing partnerships with educational aggregators, um, and these are nonprofits. These are for profits. These are state departments of education. Um, you know, these, uh, these aggregators want your stuff. They'll uh, take your metadata, they'll distribute it to their users, and they'll give you back, you know, data on how it's being used. Um, and, and, and they'll do anything they can to do this for you. Um, you know, like some of these up here, like ePals, they have 800,000 active classrooms using this platform around the world. 800,000. Um, and we have a simple agreement with them that that they can use some of our content and share our metadata with their users. Um, the Learning Registry, if, if you don't um, know about the Learning Registry or you're not involved with it, um, you, sh you probably should be. Um, and I'm happy to talk to people afterwards about that if, if they're interested. Um, we were able to do this because we worked with our general counsel office to develop a simple two-page um, memorandum of understanding that our office is able to um, to uh, enter into agreements with people that basically says, here's where you can get the metadata, here's what you can do with it, um, here's how you can or can use our logo, and here's what you have to give back to us. Um, it's really simple and straightforward. It took a little while to do, but it was really worth pursuing, and, and that's a document I'm happy to share with anyone if you're interested in sort of using that as a model for, for your, own, um, your, own, uh, your own space. Um, so three, um, so this is the allow and power um, them, you know, the, the teachers, the students to do the work, to expose the collections alongside uh, 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 tools that foster 21st century skills. Um, so this is the one I'm going to talk a little bit more about. Um, this is the Digital Learning Resources Project, which actually just ended a couple days ago. We're just in the process of publishing all the results right now. Um, and the, the impetus for this was really to help my organization better understand the current and the potential uses of educational uh, digital educational resources and, and provide a roadmap um, for, for what we do f from today moving forward. Um, and the, the reason we needed a project like this is, you know, that we have these 2,000 learning resources, but, you know, I mean, the Smithsonian has 137 million objects. I mean, you know, we're never going to digitize all of that, but, you know, today, you know, online, there are almost 800,000 images and videos available. I mean, you know, that's today. That stuff's there, and, and we're, we're digitizing constantly. And so we really, we really need to start thinking about how these audiences use that content, how we can make that experience more meaningful. Um, this project is also an exercise and sort of what I, I like to think of as organizational redefinition. So, you know, we really acknowledge that um, we need to move from being an organization that defined itself really about um, its ability to publish a crafted experience, so a lesson plan, to one that acknowledges the audience's potential, you know, really, ex I mean, explosive potential, right? Um, you know, to, to craft their own experience, to make, to use our resources to make something that's personal and meaningful for them. Um, so we started doing this by really figuring out who our audience is. Um, we did a uh, multi-year uh, 4C results audience, audience satisfaction index survey that really um, looked at um, who, are audi who are we serving now? Who is our audience? How do they define themselves? What are their motivations for coming to us? What do they do when they're there? Um, uh, and across the board, you know, visitors reported that they, they were coming to find educational resources followed by coming to find content-specific information, so primary sources, um, information on specific topics. And, and that second group was really unsatisfied. You know, we weren't providing that. We were providing very crafted content. Um, so then, uh, then we did this. Do you guys know logic models? So, yeah. <laughs> This is a really simple one, um, but uh, <laughs> it doesn't look simple, but it's really simple compared to some others. But um, it's this really great tool that helps you kind of begin at a process to think about what are the outcomes that you want for, for the people that you're serving. So the, the Digital Learning Resources Project had three sets of intended outcomes, sort of short, middle, and long term. And, and the short term uh, outcomes were really to increase teachers' skill in identifying, analyzing, and extracting digital content. Um, the long-term outcome, though, was really enable online users to become active creators of digital resources, personalized for learning in their classroom. So it's kind of where, where we're, we're moving towards. Um, so I should, we should probably talk a little bit about methodology. Um, you know, I, I work at a, at a pretty academic institution, and I, you know, Rosanna actually said yesterday was talking about um, 
you know, how educators, I think, in museums need to do a better job talking about what we do and how, how we do it. I mean, I, I, you know, we, we really need to make sure that others understand that, um, that what we do is rigorous, that what we do is based on research. And I think there's a, a, a standard assumption that it, it might not be. Um, so uh, we started this project by recruiting a lot of teachers. Um, we, we acknowledge that we had no idea how to do this, so we really needed teachers to tell us, and, and, and doing research. And so we, we, we did a really extensive literature review. We did an environmental scan to really understand um, what's already been said in the field and what are others doing that we could learn from. Um, we recruited uh, uh, a bunch of teachers in California who came together for a focus group. They, they uh, looked at Smithsonian content online. They downloaded content. They, they kind of cut it apart, put it back together, taught with it in their classroom, and then came back and told us what that process was like. And, and really the attempt in this was to figure out what pieces of that could digital tools make easier, faster, uh, more meaningful. Um, so, you know, part two of that was, you know, to, to look at that, to look at the literature review, to, to look at the environmental scan and, and really figure out where are the commonalities here, what's not being done, what are, what are, the, what are the opportunities for us. And, um, these are some of our teachers in California and some of our researchers. Um, and you know, began to think about this prototype. What would this process look like for a teacher coming to, to Smithsonian? Um, what is it that they could, could really do? What's the process for, the, for collect and sequence and layer and engage and, 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 and share? Um, so we, we were really fortunate. There were a bunch of professional development workshops going on uh, in Washington this summer. And we were able to sort of steal some time from those. And so we had K through 12 teachers who came to Washington for a week. They were doing a bunch of other stuff. But we took a few hours each day with them and uh, did prototype testing. And so um, you know, I, I spend most of my day sort of doing this, you know, sitting at a screen and, and, and working. And, you know, I got to spend my summer doing this, which is totally great. And, you know, I mean, we weren't in, like, the most glamorous spaces in our museums. But, you know, we were doing this every day. We were working with the teachers to, um, you know, to do paper pro prototyping, to, um, to uh, put them in front of digital, uh, digital prototype, um, to, to really help them help us understand uh, how, to, how to serve them moving forward. Um, so I want to show you the prototype. Um, if you have a device uh, out there, um, you can go here. Um, it's SCEMS, which is Smithsonian Center for Education Museum Studies, .navnorth.com. Navigation North is our, um, our development <laughs> partner, um, who's really, really great uh, ed tech developers, um, guys who sort of built the learning registry and brokers of expertise in California. Um, so uh, I'm going to move on. OK. Um, So what, what you're going to see here is a tool that was developed specifically um, to gather data by observing um, uh, teachers working within the summer. So it's not, uh, ooh. So, you know, it's not intended to. Do you want to try mine? Let me pull this and see. Did it come up? Let's see. My, it was my computer for the, It'll come up. So um, it, it's not intended to be, you know, a great user experience. It's really meant to be a tool. There were some very specific user experiences that we that we walked through. Um, so hopefully it'll come up here in a second. If not, you can play with it on your own. So um, if you do have it up, and uh, please feel free to play with it and continue playing with it, and you know, spread it around and, and share it with your friends and colleagues and. Um, Sure. So this is sort of a, a, a faked out homepage. Um, there's a, the main thing you want to do is there's a search up at the top, Nancy. I do. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Business. So, um, so if I, I do a search, 
so this is pulling live uh, collections information that's already already available um, digitally from the Smithsonian. Um, it's presenting it in a way that we learned from teachers that they were interested in seeing our collections presented. Um, you know, this this is really you're looking at sort of the end of week three. So this looks really different. You know, we we had developers and we had educational researchers in town who worked with the teachers in the morning and then sort of spent the rest of the day redeveloping and then presenting back the next day. And so we did that for 15 days over and over and over again and ended up with this. Um, so, you know, here you're seeing a mix of Smithsonian collections. You're seeing educational resources. Um, you're seeing some really weird, cool stuff. Um, so this is really just a different user experience built on top of, of, an, of existing technology. Um, what is different here is the ability to begin to collect and save things. So I'm adding this to my weird, um, weird catalog, and come up in, in here into my collections. Um, the difference, though, I think where where we begin to see some interest and in, and in seeing this tool potentially get at where we're beginning to sort of move is once an object is in your collection, a teacher, a user can begin to sort of create their own uh, personal localized metadata um, set. So I can come in and um, change the title of this. Um, and that's going to that's gonna persist in my, in my collection. I can come in and, you know, delete all this stuff out that isn't really meaningful to my teach to my students, and I can put in, or you know, I can rewrite something at an appropriate grade level so that my students can really understand the really high-level curatorial descriptions that don't have a lot of meaning to them. Um, I can then also begin to layer on uh, using this tool set um, learning opportunities as associated with with this collection item. So I can, in a, I can you know, put a map on here so students can understand the, the, the geographic context of this. Um, discussions, quizzes, I mean, these are sort of some tools that existed at the beginning of the research, and then you know, ones that teachers suggested. Uh, the concept cloud and the map are two things that you know, we hadn't sort of come across, but teachers again and again said, you know, we use this a lot that would work really well in, in a classroom discussion. So the idea is that a teacher begins to, to build a, um, a, a collection and, and create an opportunity that then they pass on to their students. So this is actually one that um, uh, a, a teacher made this summer where um, she was anticipating curiosity uh, happening and, uh, uh, excuse me, um, the, the curiosity landing, and wanted to teach a lesson about how innovation and technology works. <laughs> so she used some items from our collection to show how um, humans have been getting to Mars and putting technology on Mars. And, and uh, you know, she rewrote rewrote this thing. She, thinks she put uh, discussion prompts in. She began to really create an opportunity that she would then export out of a tool like this for her class website or, or other some other learning platform that she's already using. Or via a URL, via an email, view, uh, via you know, a student account, she would be able to, to share this experience with, with her classroom. Um, so I'm going to go back over to the PowerPoint because I know my time's running. But uh, um, so so that was really fun, and uh, you know, we uh, we really learned a lot. And I have some slides here about it, but I'm I'm thinking I'm going to sort of skip past those because um, this think, is all. I was going to say yeah. I think you're probably good for like five more minutes, okay. and then I'm sure there's questions from the audience, okay. so that we'll maybe at two fifteen, then we'll we'll switch over. That's Perfect. great. Um, so this is sort of all a, a really oversimplification of um, a lot of findings that came out of this work, and they're all published, and I'll, I'll point you to the wiki where that's all available um, uh, once we're done. So, mm -hmm. so we're going to build this thing. I mean, this is, you know, it kind of works a little bit. If you've been playing with it, you'll see you can kind of do some things. Some of the tools work. Most of them don't. Um, you know, the, the plan is to build this now. So we're currently in the process of fundraising to, to you know, get the money together to, to create this and sort of move this one step, one step further. Um, once that happens, so the, the, there's a basic platform and then these tools that sort of sit on top of it. And, you know, the plan is to release this open source so this can be sort of sat on top of any collection. Um, ideally, you know, and work easily with any collection. Um, and we need to figure out, you know, it was really interesting. So we had the first week we had elementary school teachers and they were kind of great and really gracious and fun. And um, we had high school, high school teachers the second week of the research. And, 
And they said, you know, this is really cool, but I'm never going to use this. My students are going to use this. Like, I want my kids in front of this. I'm not going to do this search. The kids are going to do the search. The kids are going to create a collection. They're going to create a, this learning experience. And we were like, you know, yeah, duh, right? You know, so, so you know, we're, we, we need to figure out how to do that. So what is a, you know, what is a, you know, what's a self-directed inquiry experience look like for a student accessing museum digital collections. I mean, I, I don't know the answer to that. You know, so we, we need to get these types of tools in front of those learners to begin to sort of understand that. So that's kind of kind of one of the things that that's uh, that's that's coming up next. Um, so uh, you know, we've been talking about sort of all this research and things. So I'm going to like end with this like totally unscientific <laughs> graph. Um, <coughs> But, you know, so on the horizontal here, we have usability of museum object in the real world. So, you know, can, get, can I get my hands on something? Can I, get, can, I, can I get an image of it, like a big image of it? You know, can I, can I manipulate it? Can I combine it? Can I, can I read or listen or, or um, you know, see someone who knows something about it tell me more? Um, can I find objects that help me understand it? Uh, can I make it work for me? Um, and on the vertical, we have the, you know, current or maybe future value of a museum object. Um, so that's probably very different than kind of how we think about the value of museum collections, right? It's usually about historical importance or, you know, rarity, scarcity, level of financial interest, desire. But um, uh, I think this is better. So um, I'm going to leave with a, a quote from um, someone I really admire. Um, and if you don't know Marite, you, you really should. She's sort of part of this thing called sharing is caring that's um, coming out of her and others at the National Gallery of Denmark. And, you know, she's, she's saying it's, it's, it's our responsibility to care for the art. So I think that's kind of a traditional museum perspective. But she says, I think we do that best by allowing users to find, share, and build upon our images. Um, so if, if, you're, if you don't know her work, I really encourage you to, to check that out. Um, so, um, so thank you. And I, I should say before I end, um, I'm really just a representative of a, of a team that's been working on uh, a lot of this at the Smithsonian, at our, our educational research group, Cross and Joftis, and our and Navigation North, who I mentioned. Um, they're really all to be kind of acknowledged for their insight and their, their work on this. And um, so this is the wiki address. Um, that, uh, um, you know, go there. Um, send your friends there, send your colleagues there. Um, all the research for the tool set project, the last project I talked about there, is, is there. So the literature review and the environmental scan and um, all the data collection tools, everything's up there. Um, everything's under CC0, so please use it. And um, um, thank you. <laughs> That's awesome. So I'd love to turn it over uh, to you all um, for questions that we have, burning questions. Of course, I have questions too, but. I just wanted to say, and I think after working on Arts Connected and Art NC and, and all these other tools that are developed for, with teachers in mind and students, that mm -hmm. any of us are fooling ourselves to think that we're developing a, t a research resource for teachers. Yeah. Even if you say 100 times, this is for you, they always go, my students are going to love this. Right. Mm -hmm. they, <laughs> right. they want things to hand right. their students, even if they're not even written for them. So you mm -hmm. need, I mean, it's so great to hear you say the same thing that we found over and over Yeah. Again. Well, we, we did the same thing. We're like, no, we gotta, you know, we've always served teachers. That's who we're gonna serve. And you know, and as soon as these teachers, you know, it was kind of the first teacher. We said, oh yeah, sure, sure, yeah, and that's that's right. And it was like every single teacher said that, and it was that kind of, you know, we realized mm -hmm. we were fooling ourselves. I mean, yeah. Yeah, I don't think that means that you can't have a component for teachers. Mm -hmm. And and I think they're usually the, the the tool set like you had up there can serve both. Mm -hmm. But uh, and, and I think it actually does the best benefit to serve both to a certain degree yeah. because you know they're, they're sharing that. But at the same time, to try to say there's something just for teachers. They just they just don't buy it for some reason. Right. But it seems like the strategy is to embrace this like um, uh, very pointed way of uh, nourishing curiosity and finding things by accident mm -hmm. and like following a non, I mean, nothing about that is linear. Mm -hmm. So that uh, the same way that a teacher embraces this like scouring methodology of like as much that they're going to then give back and they right. probably don't even know what parts they're actually going to teach in their classroom. That's not the point, right. um, which is super exciting. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to conclude by saying it looks awesome. Thank you. <laughs>
Let's do one and then two, yeah. Did you get any uh, pushback from the teachers in the Summer Institute about from No Child Left Behind and, you know, we got to teach reading and all that kind of stuff? Or were they, I mean, so did they, did, were they worried that their principals weren't going to buy into it? Um, no, you know, I mean, I, I think the nature of what we're trying to do, you know, fits into any, anywhere that a great teacher is going, you know, great teachers find really interesting stuff and put it into a lesson that they want, you know, regardless of that. So, that, but yeah. I work with a lot of schools and I found that mm -hmm. sometimes the teachers don't, they feel constrained. Yeah. And it yeah. Like not. not, you know, one of the tools that we didn't see in here um, and something we really didn't talk about is the idea of this tool set is once a, a teacher creates an experience or a student creates an experience, they can then share that back into the system. So mm -hmm. one of the tools that, that is in there, one of the ones that's actually working, is um, an ability for them to tag um, common core standards to the experience mm -hmm. that they've made that sort of helps inform the next thing. And so we're very, I think, conscious of that, that teachers need to be really conscious of that. Um, but I, I, the, the nature of the, the tool is it, it, it's meant to be open, so it's up to the user to make it, make it sort of fit. Mm -hmm. um, Which is the lingua franca of the way teachers think anyway, right. so right. I think that is quite good. Yeah? Uh, I was wondering, and this is both for Scott and you, um, you said the teachers think the kids would love this. Have you actually experienced the fact that afterwards we think the kid, teachers were not as good as identifying what the kids really needed or wanted or mm -hmm. liked or... It was easy and fun, right. or did you think that there was uh, the teachers are were able to really identify and understand? It's a good question. I mean, I, I think it's at the heart of, you know, we have a couple grant proposals out right now to do that research with the kids to figure out. I mean, I don't think this is exactly what kids might think is great. I think that <laughs> there needs to be some different tools. I mean, I think the basic infrastructure can work, but the, the tools need to be something that kids are going to connect with. And, you know, I don't, I don't know what that is, but, I mean, I totally agree with you. Well, yeah. and, and I just would add, one of the greatest challenges we face, I believe, is getting teachers to understand how to use technology in the classroom and how to use these tools. I mean, it might be great for their kids, but if they don't, if they, they just don't throw, it's just like putting a videotape in and not knowing what, you know, slamming a videotape in and saying, well, this is going to yeah. teach the lesson. It doesn't work that way. Right. How to work into this stuff, and, and that's heavy lifting for a lot of teachers because they don't have the professional development. Uh, Right. to know how to integrate technology mm -hmm. in their classroom. So, yeah. I mean, I think they think it's easy because it's tech and kids are going to just gravitate toward it. Right. But, but that's such a good question because in most cases, I don't think the kids know what to do with it, really. I mean, mm -hmm. they know how to push the buttons and make it work, yeah. but they don't know how to actually apply it in their learning. I'd add it's also a double whammy because teachers are not given the platform to peer to do that peer-to-peer -peer learning. I mean, there are so many teachers that do such exemplary practice, but it's just we do not have a system. I mean, you mentioned policy. I mean, there are so many reasons why exemplary teaching practice just there are not places to share that type of exemplary practice in technology. So that's we're as good as we learn from each other, just like in venues like this. So, but did you have? Can do, yeah. yeah. Should we do this and then that? Yeah, did you want to go first? Yeah. I just have something quick to say. Um, well, one thought I had was um, it would be really neat if you built in some challenges uh, for kids that students could um, relate to, like, you know, create a story with these images and, you know, or, or some other challenges that the teachers can really kind of understand. Okay, this is like all these different ways that we can challenge our kids mm -hmm. and we can set up like compare your stories or, mm -hmm. you know, do this or that. So, I mean, that would be really fun. It's great. I mean, I think it's a great, it's a great suggestion. You know, and part, part of our, our hope in this is that this tool actually can make our museum educators' lives a little easier so that they'll actually use this tool to create some sort of prepackaged experiences that are a set of a set of, you know, collection objects with these with this layer on top of them so that they begin to sort of seed to seed that so that it's not just this kind of wide open what do I do now kind of experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Two more here. Oh, I just wanted to say let's not sell our teacher community short yet. I, I there's a white container that we there are some that are uh, very right far to the advanced level of technology that we worked with. Um, but just attend ISTE, and you'll find 25,000 yeah, sure. educators every year mm -hmm. who are engaged in technology, who are eventually going to bring up their less comfortable counterparts. But I, I, I'm just, I just don't want us to sell them short because there are mm. quite a few that are engaged. But I have a question for you, Jeremy. Thank you. That, I love that um, your tool. 
what, when, it, when people create their collection, what is the output on the other side? Is it something where they have to come back to the site, or can they then take the content and put it into the blog or mm -hmm. their, the student blogs or whatever? That's the aspiration. I mean, you know, none of this really exists. So, you know, I, th there are some issues with IP and things that we haven't um, haven't resolved or really talked too much about about what happens when the the idea. I mean, that's that that's the way this needs to work. Um, you know, it can't can't exist in this system. This tool needs to be able to export these kinds of things to places where teachers are already sharing this kind of resource with their students. Um, so, you know. Yeah, but. <laughs> so I just want to say that that's really great to hear. Thank you. I'm um, coming from the other side, so I'm working with the Ministry of Education to kind of overhaul the learning management systems there. Mm -hmm. One of the concepts that we're talking about is integrating more social media like interfaces so that it's a good interface for the And I was going to say that that's, the interface language is very similar to Pinterest. Mm -hmm. Very similar to this, and the other thing is, I was going to ask is if you focus on kind of the functionality of being able to organize these kind of these pin beyond like a category boards and more of like a map mm -hmm. sort of interface, mm -hmm. so that you can also get more visual organization. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think you know the idea. The idea we hope what we can build is is a is a simple platform that really allows just sort of these collection and, and sorting and organization of things, and then sort of what you do beyond that is something that that we grow forever. You know, in a sense that we continue talking to teachers and asking them, how do you want this? What are the tools that, that sort of make this work for you? And we continue to be able to test those and, and add them on again and again. And ideally that, you know, the, the open source community buys into this and continues to develop and, and, and build upon, build things like that too, so. One more question. I would answer that you know I I I don't know if they're elusive, specifically in this context of teachers and students. I mean I you know there's billions of people on this planet and what are what do they want from us? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, um, we know a lot about what they want when they come in our doors and have a traditional museum experience, right? I mean. We at least pretend that we do. We've been doing it a while, so, you know, we, not that we're necessarily doing what we know people want, but, you know, we're, we've been doing it. You know, so I, I, I think we're maybe all asking that question. Maybe everybody at this conference is sort of in that area of, so if we have this technology and we have this content and we can, we can get it to people who will never come to our building or our country, what happens? Um, I want to know why you say it's elusive because I feel like it, 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 it isn't. And there's a lot of good models, but everybody just keeps building on them, and, and people's expectations keep changing. So yeah. I mean, I don't. What, what, why do you feel it's elusive? Because I've been around and seen people struggling. Museums are the, the museums are the educators, which audiences struggle. Mm -hmm. okay. That's my perception of this. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I would just add for those of us who work closely in urban districts and public school systems, um, I mean, to answer your point about not selling teachers short, I look at what's happening in New York City, public school education, full stop. That is so many times I've heard teachers just saying, we feel so alone. So I think it's a... I'd like to um, thank you so much, Darren. Mm -hmm. Really, I'm going to do Thank you. So I'm going to now uh, turn it over to uh, Shauna Crossman, a web content manager at the Minnesota Historical Society, and she'll be speaking about shifting our perspectives to meet the needs of 21st century learners. Thank you, Rosanna. And I'd first like to thank Darren, because, and I would like to send him back to work so he can go, get to work fast, because you will save me an enormous amount of work if you can get your project <laughs> <laughs> off the ground. First, if I can get this, it's like, you're right. Oh, why don't they make these just so they work? <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to build on a little bit on your comment back there and um, kind of talk about sort of how, as a museum, we're getting um, getting all of, all of our staff. I feel like here we're probably, I'm speaking to the choir, if any of you were at Rosanna's session yesterday, um, the last presenter talked about building your choir. So I just want to ask quickly, how many of you in here are museum educators? How about technology, tech people? Okay. How about curators? So kind of, kind of a mix. Um, I, I work with the Minnesota Historical Society, and um, so I, I feel like this is sort of a choir for me. I'm talking to a group that probably is already in the same space that I am. But back home uh, at the Minnesota Historical Society, we have a lot of staff, and we uh, started on a, a path down this road to... Um, to really redesign all of our programs to better meet the needs of 21st century learners. And not everybody was part of the choir to start with. And so what I'm going to talk about today is sort of how, we've, how we're working. It, it is, is by no means complete how we're working to get all of our staff on board and to really understand and embrace what the needs, the different needs of this generation are. And it's, um, it's, it's been a process. I have to say we were very fortunate in getting a, a source of funding through Minnesota, the state of Minnesota passed a constitutional amendment to collect sales tax called the legacy amendment um, that really has enabled us to really take some big leaps and bounds <laughs> in developing these programs. So why did we do this? Well, we all know this publication. So this came out, you know, we're looking at it, trying to figure it out. And, you know, it's great to embrace this and look at this. But this really, this was a start. But this is really why we all started down this path. It's why all of us started down this path was these guys. Um, these are my personal Angry Birds tutors. Um, <laughs> the one without a shirt on is, he's six. And um, he has taught me, this is my nephew, he has taught me uh, it's just amazing. He sits down, Shauna, you can't do it that way. This is what you do to do it better. Or plants and plants versus zombies. All of these things, and I have to tell you, it's much to my sister's chagrin. She hates the fact that her kids are so good on these things because they love to spend a lot of time on it. But they're really, really good at it. And I've tried to point out to her where they're really learning and what he what is taking off in this little guy's brain when he's figuring out all of these things. So this is why we did this. These guys were coming to our museum. We were seeing, you know, it, we all saw this coming. And it was getting really old saying, it's so hard to get these kids to settle down. It's so hard to get these kids to do blah, blah, blah. And so instead of doing this, some really wise people in our organization said, why don't we just really start building on the, this, what we're seeing the kids and their natural behaviors. And so that was really sort of the impetus for what we were doing. Um, uh, that said, there are, are, were, still are a lot of staff who are a little bit not liking this, are a little bit concerned. So this has really been, uh, we've really made a concerted effort to really pull people on board with this. Um, I'm going to see if the video will play. We're going to try this and see if you can hear it. Of course, it's never going to work when I'm here, is it? Is it going to go? All right, well, I'm not gonna. Okay, that's nope, that's the wrong one. Okay, we're not gonna do that because. Do you want me to find it? I don't know how hard is it. Is that the right one? No, that's the wrong one. I'll come back and find that one. Um, well, what I, it, it's, I had it up before. I know, that's oh, so odd. It's the one I tested before. All right. Um, this is a quote, and it's much better in the video, and I'll see if I can find it, from Wendy Jones, who's the head of our education, uh, museum education group at the Minnesota History Center, um, really talking about, you know, what, 
most of us in this room know today's students are different. We need to address them differently. Um, and really not using technology to do the same thing in a different way, but using it to take learners to a whole new place, a whole new level of understanding and about the thrill of learning. And this is a message that Wendy, who has been really one of our thought leaders, and Rose Sherman, who's our CIO over in the corner there, um, have really kind of led the way, uh, the thought leaders in our organization, to, to help bring everybody else along. And here, this is a picture of Wendy. Um, and it's her example, she's the same age as I am, and I also got a typewriter as a high school graduation gift. But we learned differently. We were taught differently. We had different expectations, as do a lot of the people in our organization who are creating these programs. We, it was one way. Um, we, these are our digital immigrant instructors, and we have a, and it's kind of like some of the teachers that I work with, certainly not all, um, who have one process of the way of doing it. And so this is why we're having to, to work with our staff. Uh, I was just in a meeting on Wednesday uh, dealing with some of our site managers, really trying to help them understand what 21st century skills are. And it's really a foreign language. Um, and it's just a real different way of thinking about interpretation and work. So a quote from our friend Mark Prensky, who I did have the opportunity to hear at a keynote speaker, as a keynote speaker at ISTE last year. And it was really, really exciting to hear him. Um, we had a couple questions we were asking ourselves. Uh, how are we meeting the needs of 21st century learners, their parents, or their teachers and their parents? And it's, like Darren said, it's, it's, um, it's not just the teachers, it's really the students. And I'll talk a little bit later about some of the research we did where that became very, very clear to us that it, again, we went in with the mindset, we, like you, that it was the teachers we were addressing. And um, that was very quickly put aside as we were talking to people. And how are we going to be relevant as an educational resource in the future? So we kind of keep these questions in the backs of our mind, uh, back of our minds as we're, as we're moving on. So uh, what I'm going to present is kind of four different, um, the processes, we really have kind of broken it down into four different pieces. The research, uh, which we did to see if we were, like you said, to see if we were in the right place, if we were, if we had the right assumptions, which I just talked about that we were building for the teacher, that was an assumption we had that was proven wrong, um, to help us decide what we were going to do and inform our process and where we were going, to confirm, make sure that we needed to do it, and really, a, I would say one of the biggest reasons was to engage the staff and to help convince the staff of the need along with um, why we needed to do this. I'll talk a little bit about some of the low-hanging fruit projects we did that really kind of got the momentum up and we could see the results of our work and why we did those, um, and to build in stakeholder support to explain why we were spending the money on these things and why we needed to keep going in this direction and to show some success. There are definitely some incremental infrastructure changes that we're making. Those are much slower process, but not uh, very important, obviously, um, and how you make change with limited resources. And then some new paradigms and ways of, of, um, of teaching and uh, teaching history in different ways. Another concept of this is um, we work with a broad teacher audience, everything from those. I have some teachers who have taught me an enormous amount about how to teach digital or 21st century skills using technology in a classroom. And then we have other teachers that we do feel like we're sort of a model for them and helping them along the way, maybe providing a little bit of that professional development for them along the way. So we sort of see kind of a two, twofold. Um, in terms of uh, the research, the biggest thing that we've done, like Darren, was focus groups. We did an enor quite a few focus groups along the way. We did some about fo field trips. Um, we did a, a number about online resources and how teachers are using technology in the classroom. We also did parent focus groups, student focus groups. Uh, it's just, and now it's really just turned into a paradigm where we do focus groups for just about any project. Um, we found some ways to do some real low cost focus groups. Um, and they're just, it, it really has been a huge paradigm shift for us is to realize that these focus groups aren't a scary thing. And more than that, teachers really, really want to be involved. And they love to be asked. Um, this woman here drove, uh, this was not a focus group I did, but she drove 374 miles round trip to participate. I had teachers who drove 200 miles easily to participate. And it takes up a whole Saturday. And you wonder, why are they giving up a Saturday to participate in this? But they love it. And uh, so it's really confirmed us, uh, our, our path that we're taking to do this. And I'm not watching my time, so. <laughs> um, these are not real people. These are fake people. <laughs> but they are crucial to what we're doing now. And again, this was a little bit of a, um, they're just personas. Any of you who develop websites use personas. Um, but these are our friends. 
we use these personas. One of our projects uh, had a bunch of personas developed, and we've just adopted these as our institutional personas. So they all have an identity. They all have a biography. We write a use case for each project. We write a use case for what, what, why are they on here. Um, this is Sixto, our little, our little sixth grader here who's using technology. Um, this is Rhonda. She's our rabbit teacher. She's ready to go and integrate any technology in our classroom. Um, this is Howard. He does History Day. Howard Day does History Day. They all have an alliterative. <laughs> Rhonda, oh, I'm not gonna, Rhonda Reynolds is our Sally rabbit. Sh Sally, Sally Schneider is our snail teacher. She's just a little slower <laughs> to adopt things, but you can kind of convince her. Um, these folks come to all of our meetings. We have placards or little stand up things with all of them and they come to all of our meetings and sit at the table. Um, we do develop other personas specific to um, projects, but these guys are our best friends and come along all the time. And this has been, for staff, for those of us who develop websites, this is nothing new, but for staff who's involved in projects who aren't a big part of website development, this is a fairly new concept and um, I, I think this has been a pretty big paradigm shifting, um, help to shift their paradigm and think differently. Testing, we all do testing and user testing. This is an exhibit that's about to open in a couple of weeks called the Now Wow, and they're testing. We had the incredible luxury of having an empty exhibit space for almost two years, uh, where we did a lot of testing with cardboard and all sorts of stuff, um, really getting in deep and digging. It was really great. And we used this testing space for all sorts of things. Again, nothing new. Classroom testing, um, one of the projects I'm going to talk about just briefly at the end uh, is a, a uh, it's called Northern Lights. It's a sixth grade a curriculum for Minnesota history focused aimed at sixth grade. And obviously as a textbook, we are facing um, some very significant paradigm shifts in how we deliver this content. So we have an iPad app um, that any of you can download for free now to test to see what we're doing. Um, and we took it out in classrooms. and. The last time I was teaching in a classroom was over 20 years ago, and so it was really great for me to get back in classrooms and for some of our staff that have never taught or aren't used to this perspective to take the, the publishers out into the classroom was really an eye-opening experience. We also had the good fortune to, fortune to work with a class um, at the University of Minnesota a marketing class, which for us was a different experience to look at things really from a marketing perspective and with marketing students. Um, but we, they were assigned to take, they took our textbook as their case study for the semester and they had to come up with the marketing plans, kind of the what works, what doesn't work and make recommendations for us. And so we took, uh, I think, four of the students along with us on some of the classroom testing. And they were very skeptical. These were college juniors. They were very, very skeptical about us going into this digital path, especially we had this proposed iPad app that we were launching, and they were very skeptical and thought kids would never, they would never focus if they had an iPad, they'd be too distracted, and how can you read on the iPad, and, and they were very negative to start. Um, and let me tell you, after that day of watching the kids use the iPad app, they had totally changed their minds. It was really interesting. It was fun to see. Um, and I just love this picture. We did do some surveys with the kids. Do you use, learn better using the print version or the iPad version and why? And <laughs> it came, really wasn't a fair question, but um, I think all in four classes of about 30 kids, I think two kids said the book and the rest all said the iPad. It wasn't really fair because it was fun, and, but it was still fun to see them. Um, that piece, especially what those college students saw, along with a lot of our testing in <coughs> this then now wow exhibit space and we did a lot of testing with field trips at a lot of our historic sites um, we quickly realized this again was a real perspective or paradigm shifting moment was we really needed to shift our idea of what it meant what student engagement meant we had to really redefine in our minds what it meant just because a kid was running all over the place didn't mean they weren't grabbing content and understanding content and for some of our staff that was really a big shift um, this one is actually really, when you were talking about it, this is what I kept thinking about. I was fortunate to be able to bring in 10 teachers for a week this summer, and we did, a, uh, we called it teacher camp, and we had them in for, uh, for a week, and we just talked about digital primary sources. It was a great experience. Um, we had first grade up to eighth grade teachers. We'd hoped to get some high school teachers, but I'm hoping to get money to do that one next summer. Um, 
I learned a tremendous amount from these teachers where we really just talked about how they're using the primary sources in their classroom and really reiterating a lot of what Darren found in terms of what they want to do with them and how they're doing it. The, the, they had two main tasks. One was to tell us what sources we should digitize and make available and then what we should, how we should wrap them or what kind of context they round it, wanted around them. Um, although that, if you have the personalized way, then my whole thing goes to pot, but that's okay, that's even better. Um, because what we've been hearing from teachers all the time was that we had too much stuff online. Um, for example, if you go on our collections and you search for Civil War, you'll get 970 objects. Well, I don't know about you, but there's not a lot of teachers who have time to search through 970 objects in order to pick out the, few, the two or three they're going to use in their class. So we kept saying, I love your stuff, it's way too much. Um, and then also when they got to our collections online, there was a lot of information on there that really wasn't useful for them. They really didn't care about nomenclature or some of those things that you know, to us are very important. Um, so we asked them to help us define how we select which sources. We're committed to making an experience where they might be able to find 10 objects about the Civil War. And we thought, we know all these things. We can pick what should be there. Well, yeah, no, this was a big paradigm shifting moment for me. Um, we're not always right in what we pick. This was an object, we, a photo we picked. We thought this is a great object, a really nice photo. It tells a lot. We can see a lot in it. Yeah, no, they hated it. <laughs> they really hated it. And this was the one they preferred. And I'm hoping the audio works on this because this is great. Well, I, 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 I do. But the, re the reason why I do is because it's too easy. It's too simple. It's three guys. Not this they're, picture. They're it's now, the other picture that he doesn't like. Things. And that's what all there is to it. There, there isn't, you know, it's so direct. And you don't see the kind of, the, he doesn't paint the complete picture. Because I look at this and I say, well, let's just say my sixth grader isn't going to say, oh, that looks like the, the guys that stand on the street corner trying to get you to sign the fair tree. You know, the people that are still on street corners now, okay? The picture that I wanted to use... That's this so one. ...kind of see it from the middle. This one I liked a lot more because there's so much more going on. There's so many more questions that could be asked, and some of them will be answered, and some of them that won't necessarily be answered. Um, you know, in terms of all of a sudden, okay, now you see it's not just three guys standing on a street corner by themselves. You have all these different people. You have young people. You have older okay. people. It goes on, and he has just a great explanation of why the second one worked better than the first one. Um, and that was, I don't know, but it was huge for me to see a picture that we thought the exhibits folk liked the other one. A lot of people liked the first one better from our perspective, but when we heard from the teachers, it, it totally changed the way we were thinking about things. And so we now have a project where we've had curators um, from the collections areas on certain you know, favorite teacher topics, fur trade, immigration, American Indians. They're picking objects. We're picking like 20 or 30, either photographs or objects. And then we're going to take those to teachers and have the teachers select which of those things they would like to have online. So it's really changed our process in how we're approaching what we digitize. A lot of the stuff is online anyway, but when we have it in this specific area for teachers to find, um, we've, we're letting the teachers pick what should be on there instead of us. So that was a big moment. Um, learning from an educator's perspective, this was another piece of research I think that's really been profound um, and important. This is the first museum conference I've been to in about two and a half years. I haven't, you know, I used to come to all of them, and I really haven't been to any lately because I've been going to things like ISTE, which is a teacher conference, 20,000 teachers, um, and that to me has been the best learning experience ever. Um, my PLN is, I spend a lot of time on my personal learning network, learning, but there are no, there aren't very many of you museum folks on there anymore. It's all, it's all teachers, some of the real, the big thought leaders in the teacher community. Um, so that my Twitter list has changed dramatically in the last few years and that's who I'm following and learning from now. I've been really trying to get staff to create their own personal learning network but there's a lot of people who are really afraid of being on Twitter and I feel sorry for them because it's such a great learning experience. Um, some of the things we've tried to do for staff education uh, to help staff understand and learn and learn at their own pace when they're not a f in a way that's comfortable for them. Um, we have a staff blog, and I have to say that has not been as successful as we have wanted because there's only a couple of us who post to it, and it's 
it's too bad, but it's fun. We tried it anyway. Um, this On the Move is our Minnesota version of ISTE. It's ties. It's the local uh, teacher education or teacher technology conference, and so that's coming up. So we get a lot of staff going to that conference. <clears throat> We've done a few big presentations where we talk about the results of our focus groups and everything. And then also the 21CL group is a group primarily of historic sites staff um, to help to educate them and how they can make some small changes to their programs really to incorporate 21st century skills. And that's been very successful. Um, now we'll see if this works. I want to talk a little bit about some of the low-hanging fruit that we've done. This was a field trip video. We made a, a concerted effort to add video about all of our field trip experiences. So I'm going to show that worked. <laughs> Before texting, before email. Can you hear that? Even before our alphabet. And ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. There were people here in Minnesota who communicated by carving symbols into rocks. And I'm surprised it didn't disappear. Bison, snakes, herds, thunderbirds, weapons. For thousands of years, American Indians have come to Jeffers Petroglyphs to worship. Everybody feels the sacredness and specialness of this place. With these carvings, they recorded the story of their lives. The fact that it's in Minnesota is really cool. When you visit Jeffers Petroglyphs, you'll get to see many of the carvings. It's an extra right here that's in the Nate Valley Road. That is something. You'll throw a spear with an ad lottery. At a buffalo target. Oh, excellent. And you'll create your own winter cup. Simple. Each symbol represents one year in this tribe's life. You'll learn about the American Indians who interacted with these carvings. <laughs> and find out some of their meanings. What do you suppose that might be? What do you jumpy. think that symbol is? Think about it, talk about it, and see it for yourself at Jeffers Petroglyphs. <laughs> so this video, we incorporated some 21st century concepts, leaving with a critical thinking question, um, having the kids be very hands-on and interactive. And so we did this for a number of sites. So that was a low-hanging fruit. It was very successful. It was quick um, and, and really helped with a number of things. There were also some field trip components that they um, I mean, just small tweaks to different field trip components with some amazing success. One quick story I'll tell you is that our Forest History, Forest History Center, they turned kind of the straight guided tour into a situation where the students came in and they were presented with a problem that the, the food was going to be late. It was going to be delivered a couple days late, and how are they going to handle it? So then the kids had to solve this problem. The engagement, the teacher satisfaction, everything just went through the roof. And so that was a fairly minor tweak to that program that has been very successful. Um, I'm going to show you just quick. We changed a, a field trip orientation, again, from someone speaking to the kids. Again, this seems all very obvious, but until you actually did it, it wasn't. Into a Prezi. That's very interactive, and we've had amazing reports from the teachers. Again, this is just a video of it, and at the time, there's a human being helping with it. But it's increasing um, engagement, attention, and the kids are actually here listening to it and paying attention. Um, okay. So some of the infrastructure things that we've changed, really, it's, it's taking this stuff and internalizing these concepts. These are some of the... the traits of a 21st century learner and everything is about how do you engage these 21st century learners so these things are things that we just keep always at the front of our mind when we're developing anything from a field trip to an online experience to a curriculum you know kids want to get this information fast they prefer graphics and sound over text they're parallel processing multitasking these are all the you know the traits we know random access nonlinear um, they love the networking. We know that. We see that all the time. Instant gratification rewards and prefer games over serious work, like all of us should. So these things are just things we just, it's just there. We always know that. We, follow, we use the four C's of 21st century learning extensively. Um, critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, collaboration, communication. Those things, too, are just internalized and things that we use all the time. We have added a couple more. 
content and context. So those two pieces are also things that we think about all the time when we're developing really any program. Um, brand, we, our whole education brand has been changed really based on a lot of the research that we did. I'm not going to spend any time on this, but um, everything we do, this is sort of our brand platform, the promise, the words around it. So these things also are kind of internalized and this really drives. Is every experience that someone is having at our organization from an educational perspective, does it meet all of these things? <coughs> Um, staff living by example, we moved to Google Apps about a year ago. Um, this again was not a quick and easy change for some people, <laughs> but um, for those who are embracing it and we're seeing it happen more and more, um, it's really been a great way for the staff to sort of live by example about the collaboration and the sharing and again, a big paradigm shift for some people. Um, quick examples of some of the things we have. Then Now Wow is the exhibit that's opening at the end of the month that was designed specifically for kids. It's just full of 21st century concepts. Um, I haven't seen it lately and I'm so excited to see where it goes. Um, the U.S. Dakota War is a website that we just launched about a month ago um, that in, has a lot of interactives, tons of primary sources, has video, um, different places. So, it's usdakotawar.org, and uh, take a look at it. It's, it's tons and tons of content, and many, many different ways and modalities of accessing that content. History in Our Hands is, goes along with uh, the Then Now Wow exhibit, and it's a mobile experience on iPods, and we've been doing a ton of testing on this, and this has been great. And this is an example of not just tossing the technology in the kids' hands, but really using it to encourage um, critical thinking. And Northern Lights is a project that I'm heavily involved in, is the textbook, the sixth grade textbook. And um, it's, uh, the paradigm shifting on this has been significant from a big textbook to really how do you deliver this content. Um, the, the example I always use is the textbook is over here, this is where we eventually want to get, and how do you move it from this very linear print-based tool to something very different. And uh, it's been a big change in terms of how this is handled for staff who've been publishing for a long time. Um, so it's just, it's, a const, it's just a gradual change in how we get there. And by putting them in classrooms with kids to watch them interact with the iPad app, which is a small step along that pathway, it certainly isn't the end where we want to go. Working with teachers who are creating iBooks for us, thinking about different ways to create more nonlinear access to this content. Um, it's just a slow, slow step along the way. And we, uh, if you would like to download the app, we'd love to get your feedback. It's a bit.ly slash Civil War app. And I don't have that up on the slide. You didn't tell me to do that. So I can mm -hmm. do that, and then I'll post it if you have any questions. And I think that's all I had. So thank you. Um, so again, I think I'd love to hear uh, questions from the audience for uh, for Shauna, if there are. Yeah. Um, one thing that I really like about both of your uh, presentations, the fact that you were very successful in, in getting uh, teachers engaged in developing what you've done, I have struggled enormously to get that really? done. Um, we lure them in with prices. Everything, but they don't show up. They don't participate to serve. Really? They don't. It's really we're having like a huge amount of learning. And Indianapolis Museum of Art. We even had we had a committee, even part of the grant, to um, kind of is the design tool for our bubble that was it appears huh. and it was a failure. We had like a group of teachers at the beginning. They never showed up for any of the session. It was really huh. we were having a hard time. So I was like, is it just? We do. We wow. We offer, wow. Books. Yes. We offer like, yeah, we have tried a few things and we're not being very successful. So it was like, do you have any tips? <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, those, yeah. You, you've yeah. named all the things yeah. that, we, that, that yeah. we've done. I, you know, I don't know if this is helpful, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, you know, there was a great session yesterday about um, citizen science, and um, I was telling Michael this this morning. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Nancy, I'm not sure if Nancy's still here, Nancy asked, um, you know, how do you design, a, how do you do this from the beginning? How do you design this to get people to actually 
have an interest in participating? You know, other than the kind of core people who are, might be interested in the content, how do you how do you how do you build this from the beginning to sustain it? And and um, the speaker was really talking about um, you know when they first did that, they 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 led with how cool they thought it was or what a great opportunity it was for people, and that really failed. What really worked was for them to appeal to. Um, to people's interest in, in giving. Um, and so once they, they put the scientists out front to say, you know, I need your help with this. And when you help me, I'm going to be able to do this. I'm going to be able to understand this. Um, I don't know if there's something in that for getting teachers involved. I mean, you know, the, the example that I talked about with the teachers this summer, you know, we kind of had them captive, but we always led sort of every day with, you know, you guys are the only ones who are going to get to see this prototype. We built this for you because we want to do a better job at, at serving you. And we don't know how to do that without you telling us. And so this is really important time. Um, you know, I, I don't know if there's something in that. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Is yeah. that the season to get them involved? Is that it's because maybe like with it's enough too much during up. the winter time. <laughs> uh, yeah, with, I would say yeah. yes. With enough heads up. Yeah. I mean, I think yeah. that's the whole yeah. part of it, right? right. Is that that's their downtime and like it, it gets spoken for really quickly right. as downtime. Mm -hmm. Right. Maybe yeah. Maybe another suggestion. Mm -hmm. All of those things are things that I've done as well. I mean, the only other thing I can think of is if you can go to um, administrators and actually go to district administrators and make a plea to them and then do a, some sort of collaborative relationship mm -hmm. programming around it yeah. get the administrators involved so that and, and also maybe tell them we can offer you the funding for the stipends but and then mm -hmm. they can select the teachers and then make sure that happens i mean that would be my next suggestion mm -hmm. that's a good point go. And whether it's a day or i mean right. i don't know if you're trying to get them involved for two hours or a day or yeah. 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 as i'm right. saying it's yeah i'm sure the educators professional development opportunities sure. There's not a lot of um, resources. Huh. So the, other, like the other thing we've done is we've hired teachers specifically to come in on projects. We hired two teachers to develop our I, to develop an iBook for us out of iBook Author. And so it's really been re relationship building, I think, has gotten us uh, it, to where we're going. But hire them for specific projects. Um, and sometimes you're going to get good stuff and sometimes you're not. But it's building that relationship, I think, has been yeah, pretty the, crucial. The other thing that I can I can say from working with, with teachers is that um, making them feel, I think a lot of times they feel like we're taking advantage of them. We, they, they don't understand that we're I doing this that to experience. help them, but they feel like is not. We're, we're kind of sucking them dry. And I if you can make them yeah, feel I, like they are really important to us, mm -hmm. I mean, we would take that, we would arrange a special tour of storage because of, because they never get to see yeah. that. And it made them feel like they were having something that was really special and really unique and mm -hmm. made them feel like, we actually ended up, for Arts Connected, printing business cards for some of the teachers who were actively involved with mm -hmm. us because just mm -hmm. giving them that feeling like they were something important to the museum and teachers need more reward for the day to day And they're always asked to participate in focus groups, but. but and I want to say something about that because it's something that, um, that I, I've thought about a lot too, and I think I, in pre conversations of a session we did yesterday, this idea of like gathering people around and being like, tell us what to do with our <laughs> resources. We have so much. And that for teachers sitting on the other side of the table, if it's not an, a really um, uh, clear mm -hmm. exchange, uh, and I think that goes for any group that you're working with in museums. I mean, this is like not specific to teachers, but any of your community outreach. Or, that is a really not powerful um, method of exchange. I think to be very clear what the exchange is is, is pretty key. So. I just want to add on to that. I mean, we have a different experience. Yeah. Yeah. I would say we that too. We had a focus group on, on the iPad, and uh, we you know we were concerned about. Um, why they're really, you know, we're concerned about the business model, basically. And we had teachers coming saying to us at that focus group, you know, Pearson Education and Hopeland Whitland would never bring us in to ask us questions. Mm -hmm. You know, we are you know, we are grateful that you're asking us, and you know, we're we are, uh, engaged with you guys because we respect your authority, I mean your accurate authenticity, your authority and so forth. And we want to work with you and help you build this thing so we can be able to solve it. Yeah. Well, I think I think one of the things that we should point out, because I, I do think that, that we're looking at things very differently, is 
you're working in the world of history museums, which are closely tied to curriculum. And art museums are in this other world, okay. weird, mysterious world, and art teachers function. <laughs> a perceived exclusivity and elite experiences. I mean, let's yeah, be right. real. But, and but, <laughs> but, you know, we have some people, too, that love to participate. And we don't have to drag everybody in kicking and screaming. I'm not, I'm not, really, I'm not really dissing teachers by any means or their interest in, in working with us. But these hurdles are, 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 are tough. But when I hear when you guys talk about what's going on in history and I think about what's going on in, in, in art museums, I think there are di very different mm. challenges. And art teachers and history teachers yeah. are empowered in different ways. But you know, what's curious about that to me is one of the big messages we're getting is cross-disciplinary. Mm -hmm. And when I'm thinking about my son's middle school, he's, he, you know, they do go to the art teacher, but they're also having cross-disciplinary art and language arts and history. And so, why is it so different? Because the arts are getting cut all the time. Yep. Because there, no one's cutting social studies. Yes, they are. Yeah, well, in our see, experience, not yeah. the same way they're cutting the arts. Yeah, yeah but there, there is cross-disciplinary, but not every school district mm -hmm. can do that and has the ability to do that. And with Common Core and all these other, and that's why the person who's talking about, you know, why are, are people struggling, I think it's the nature of the education system. It's the landscape is changing all the time, and that has an effect on the things that we so, you know, I'm not saying that you have it easier than the art people do. I definitely don't want to get to that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Uh, okay. okay. yeah. It all relates. But unfortunately, interdisciplinary, even if a principal says they want to do it, they, they're so taxed with so many things that they can't always do it. But they're definitely, they're not going to say, we're going to have studio art over history. They're not, because there are no standardized tests right. that focus on studio art. It's just not going to happen. So, you know what I mean? So yeah. I think that's where, I think there's great work being done. I think it's, we're all hugely contributing, all of us in this room, but it's just, I think it's a reality of the education system mm -hmm. that we're all, and I think that's why that comment, you know, that the gentleman in the back was saying, we're all struggling to deal with what the education system keeps doing too. So we, we have an idea, we know, we think we know, mm -hmm. we should trust what we think we know, but it's hard when we're always responding to the things that change. The word crisis is actually an understatement. More questions or comments? We've got about five minutes. Tim O'Reilly, what is Web 2.0 essay 2005? Identifies who your customer is, your co developer, is one of the primary characteristics of the successful online products. So I would encourage everyone who's thinking about this relationship that you have with your people you're serving to kind of think about that. This is a core capacity of being successful in this effort because your customer is your code developer. And that brings along with it a set of habits that most of us aren't encouraged to really? invest time and effort. Yeah. And we really need to every single day. It's time another, consuming. The, the trailhead I thought of is Clay Shirky's cognitive surplus. He talks a lot about different forms of intrinsic motivation, what motivates people to give to a higher cause. And it's a little bit, it's a little seminar, very actionable ideas about how to, how to think about that. So incredible anecdotes about how providing incentives to people actually makes them less willing to participate. Mm -hmm. um, it's fascinating, fascinating. It's a fine line. Well worth reading. Could someone tweet that? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, any other uh, thoughts or questions, challenges, things that you're thinking about, things that you're... That you're doing. Oh, go on. <laughs> if, if, is there something that, that, that you have done in the last year that you would supersize? Mm, that's a good question. That's <laughs> work that you would apply the full pressure and force of your organizations on. So what, what's really working? Mm -hmm. Wow. Um. So, I guess, I, you know, I talked to for a second about the sort of metadata sharing, you know, and I, you know, we, some of us at some of our institutions, I think, struggle with, with doing that at, at a larger scale talking about collections and, and, you know, there's some pieces of the Smithsonian that have begun to 
explore that and sort of figure out what that is. I don't think we really know what happens if you put millions of collection records and images and things out there. There's some people, you know, in Europe that are starting to do that. Um, so I mean, that's something I want to see, at least at our institution. I'd like to see us jumping, you know, forward and changing our policies and, and um, making that stuff really available in a really big way um, so that all these people can get at it and really begin to do these things in, in ways that, that, that are simpler. I think the project personally that I would like to really run with is the Northern Lights project, um, taking the textbook right now. And oddly, we have huge, uh, huge pre-orders for the textbook. Um, and just to really be able to explore how we can take that content and turn it into a different experience um, is something I just, I want to just go, go, go. And uh, I, I can't. But we'll get there. Um, well, right now, part of it is content. We're still, we do a tremendous amount of work developing the content and vetting and working with groups. We have, you know, huge, especially the investment in American Indian content. And so right now we're just finalizing the content. So I'm kind of stuck waiting for that final content to come. Um, money is part of it. It, it. And a huge part of it is just the, pair, the shifting into how, um, getting people to understand really that we can deliver content in a nonlinear way and it'll work. And that's an internal struggle that um, it's just a big change so I, I'm excited to get going and then the resources to have the people to build the interactives and to build all of that stuff I'd love to do it all myself but I can't so anyway. I think it's a, a perfect spot to uh, to wrap it up thank you so much you guys